yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, this is what uh, this is. I don't know if you remember, but there was a time before the pandemic, and uh, there was a very nice conference in uh, uh, in Korea in Daejeon, uh, where one of the Axion search centers is located uh, in uh, November, I believe, of uh, uh, 2019, and some of the uh, people involved in the um, uh, Axion business are uh, uh, were, were there, and it was a lot of fun. Except for Marie Curie, uh, this is a science park there with all kinds of nice things um, and statues of famous scientists there, and, and we had a good time. And uh, I must say, um, uh, we, we're talking about this uh, uh, dark matter and specifically um, um, ultralight uh, basodic. Uh, dark matter, and um, uh, I think it is very important to remember that uh, we are talking about something which we haven't found yet. Uh, so even though we um, uh, we live our lives uh, uh, studying these things that we haven't found yet and building theories about them and making pictures and gain, gaining sometimes confidence uh, in what we are talking about, but we, we still haven't seen it and we don't know. And uh, if, if there is time, we'll, and we'll see how this goes, uh, I, I will maybe mention um, uh, uh, that uh, if you talk to different people, they believe different things. And uh, uh, that, that is an interesting situation. One has to remember that the truth uh, eventually lies in the experiment um, and it will decide who is right. For instance, there is a, a Professor Zhitnitsky here and he, he very firmly believes uh, in uh, a, a, a paradigm of dark matter that has to do also with axion in a way, um, but it's something that, uh, called um, uh, uh, axion quark nuggets. And maybe I'll, I'll mention briefly to you what it is, but it's very different from ultralight bosonic dark matter. And then there are of course uh, people who spend their uh, lives searching for weakly interactive massive particles, which uh, we should remember is also very um, a prominent uh, a candidate and still not ruled out and, and it fits beautifully, I think, in, in, in our pictures of uh, how dark matter could have formed. And that's also a possibility. And then, uh, and then there are uh, people who, who actually think that there is no dark matter, but, uh, but something else. And uh, um, people who believe in dark matter dismiss those people uh, frequently who don't believe in dark matter. But, but again, uh, I, I, my, uh, personal opinion, uh, which uh, does not necessarily match the opinion of the sponsors, <laughs> so to say, is that um, one has to, to really keep an open mind to different possibilities and explore them um, and be a bit humble uh, 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 about this and, and be, be a bit skeptical about people who, who speak confidently about things we haven't discovered yet. So with this little uh, uh, introduction, I'd like to show you, I guess, the main slide of my talk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, the dark matter is an elephant in the, in the room um, uh, question. It's, a, it's really a big question because um, the way this appears is a bit bizarre. So physics, you would agree, is a pretty advanced uh, subject and, and yet it appears uh, that uh, we don't know what 80% of matter um, in, the, uh, in the universe is. And this is, uh, I guess, an important question uh, for us. And um, if you think about it, this is not the only uh, Im uh, important question of, or, or elephant in the room. There is a, a matter, antimatter asymmetry. So if you look around, um, uh, I mean, in the universe, uh, there's 10 orders of magnitude uh, more uh, matter than antimatter, or practically speaking, no antimatter, except when you make it in some collisions. Uh, and uh, there is a high degree of symmetry uh, between matter and antimatter that we find experimentally. So we need to, to explain uh, this uh, issue. Um, then uh, there is another uh, uh, problem. Maybe it's a slightly smaller elephant, but still um, it's maybe an important one. So uh, according to current notion, there's 80% uh, the ratio of, um, of dark matter to normal matter uh, is about 80% um, uh, 
uh, dark 20% normal. Um, and um, why, why is it on the order of one, right? It's on the logarithmic scale if like this is like uh, on the order of one. Could have been anything, could, could have been like uh, uh, matter, anti-matter, 10 to the 10, but it's on the order of one. That's also need some uh, explanation potentially. Actually, uh, I, I had also a, que uh, uh, a question uh, related to this uh, uh, that I wanted to, to uh, ask uh, actually uh, uh, Andreas uh, and Joseph in the end of the previous talk. Um, so uh, we see that this theta parameter is, uh, is, uh, uh, is very small, uh, near, near zero. And we're trying to explain that. But do we need to uh, philosophically, if it was, for example, pi, it has to be something from minus pi to pi. So if it was pi, pi over four, would we say, oh, there is a, a strong CP problem to explain why is it pi over four? Or would there be, maybe it, it just has to be something. So, so that's, a, that's a bit of, a, I guess, a philosophical <laughs> question. Anyway. Uh, more um, uh, elephants, so the strong CP problem discussed by Andreas, um, right? So why is this data small? <laughs> and um, uh, then there is another uh, uh, problem, uh, which is called a hierarchy problem. There's many ways to formulate it, but one is that um, if you uh, look at the sort of natural scales of physics, um, you find the, the grand unification scale um, uh, or, or um, um, or, the, or, or the Planck scale or something like this. So we're talking about 10 to the 16, 10 to the 19 uh, 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 GeV. And uh, if we look at uh, the masses of the particles, they, they are many, 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 many orders of magnitude lighter. Um, all particles, including the heaviest one we have found. And uh, why is there such a big uh, range of, uh, of scales uh, that also needs uh, explanation? Then uh, there is a, a, a dark energy uh, problem with the accelerated expansion of the universe. Uh, so I so, um, guess it's an exciting uh, time uh, because we have all of, the, all of these problems and uh, uh, it, it means that we're sort of ready to find a solution to them and, and intellectually appealing, it would be super nice if somehow it, appear, it all happens to be um, sort of one holistic solution uh, and all of these puzzles might be explained by different aspects, uh, like in that pro proverb about a bunch of blind people describing the elephant, touching it from different uh, uh, sides and describing something very uh, different. So anyway, um, coming back to uh, dark matter. Um, so uh, there is evidence that comes uh, from uh, a number of spatial scale for it. The smallest spatial scale is actually a galaxy uh, where the rotation curves uh, indicate uh, the, the, uh, that there is something going on that we uh, don't understand, uh, uh, and dark matter is one possibility, but um, from the very beginning, um, well, actually, the beginning was very soft. So uh, I think it, uh, uh, it maybe from 1930s, the first evidence for dark matter from the observation of galactic uh, clusters uh, goes back to the work of Zwicky and others, maybe in the, even in the 30s. Uh, and, uh, but, but, but basically the problem was crystallized in 1970s by, by the work of Vera Rubin and colleagues uh, on, on, on galactic rotation uh, curves. Um, but uh, as soon as that problem was formulated, uh, 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 people immediately formulated two, two sort of big, big hypotheses. One is that, okay, that we need to, to, to add some, some more matter that, that we don't see. And, and there's another school uh, that said, no, actually, look, um, uh, maybe gravity uh, doesn't work uh, the way we think it works on big distances, because really, how do we know about gravity? It's mostly this uh, study of planetary systems. So it's a certain very, very small scale, um, even compared to the galaxy. And so if you go to 
to the to the to the bigger scale, maybe you need to to just uh, rewrite uh, the equations uh, of gravity, and uh, this. Uh, 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 gave birth to a number of uh, uh, models and one class of models is called modified Newtonian dynamics. And um, um, it's, it's an interesting situation uh, with one, uh, like I said, depending on whom you talk, uh, you get different opinions. Um, I must say uh, uh, dark, uh, workers in dark matter uh, seem to pretty universally be rather critical uh, about Mond, but, but there are also people who um, uh, who are, are, are thinking that this is actually um, uh, promising. Uh, and uh, uh, if, you, if you are interested, uh, I, we can discuss this further uh, in the discussion uh, section. I can maybe give you my um, uh, outsider and dilettant perspective on that. Okay, uh, that, so along the same lines, uh, there are continuing attempts to um, uh, to see what other things rather than dark uh, matter uh, can can explain what we are seeing. And um, I, I had a lot of fun with um, my uh, uh, one of my teachers from my uh, you know from 40 years back, my university years, uh, Professor Dmitry Rutov. Uh, who is um, actually um, uh, an expert on on the on the limits uh, for photon mass, and and from his work, um, uh, the the current limits on photon mass listed in the particle data group uh, are are derived. And so the question that um, uh, he, uh, uh, Victor Flambaum and I looked at is: uh, uh, Can you uh, uh, take some very very small photon mass? That by itself will have very very negligible effect uh, directly um, on on the galactic dynamics, but it would um, effectively modify um, uh, uh, modify the Maxwell's uh, uh, equations that you use to describe the the plasma uh, in, in the galaxy, and uh, that was a lot of fun because we uh, saw that uh, if even if you give a photon ten to minus five uh, with uh, current already tiny limit. Um, it, it gives produces uh, enough forces uh, in the in the galaxy uh, to uh, in, uh, potentially explain the rotation curves. Uh, unfortunately, you know when you start making some 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 theory about things, you have to 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 like face the consequences, so to say. And and we started getting predictions um, of all stars moving on, on a very highly elliptical. Uh, orbits uh, as is not observed, so so this model is not doing uh, very well. But it was a, a lot of fun to to work on this. Okay, and so there's a number of things: black holes, dark planets, interstellar gas. I think th this class of objects is uh, nothing is dead, by the way, on this list. So there are uh, proponents of uh, every item here. Um, and wimps. Okay, I like to to joke that uh, you know if you assign the probability of uh, what dark matter is by the amount of uh, euros or dollars spent on its search, then WIMPs are definitely <laughs> dark matter because people have been looking. Uh, it was like, I believe, uh, maybe for, for the last oh, 20 years, the, the primary candidate and there are these big experiments that are uh, looking for these particles. And, and um, because uh, you know th these experiments are very impressive and they co continuously uh, are improving, uh, but they, they haven't found uh, anything. And so uh, uh, the, I, I believe uh, the parameter space is not closed uh, for, for WIMS, but, but just because for a long time people have found nothing, the enthusiasm is uh, waning a bit and, and at least this gives good grounds to consider basically the topic of our today's discussion. And this goes under the, under the general rubric of ultralight uh, bosonic uh, dark matter. So we will uh, once again discuss uh, uh, why um, ultralight necessitates it to be bosonic, which, which honestly uh, blew my mind. I, I, I'm a relative newcomer, so now Maybe some seven years I've been working, and uh, um, so I, I, I didn't sort of grow up with looking for dark matter. My background is actually tabletop atomic 
uh, uh, physics. And so uh, I had to learn all this stuff um, uh, at, at already at, at, uh, being a grown up, uh, so to say, scientifically. And uh, when I realized uh, that um, uh, somehow, okay, we're talking about something uh, we do not um, really know and never detected, but we know it's spin. Uh, pretty confidently, and I'll, I'll show you. It's as an elementary argument. In fact, Andreas already uh, mentioned this, but I'll go over this because it's really mind mind blowing um, <laughs> how this works. Okay, so depending on the on the uh, on the spin and parity of the particle, there's a whole zoo of these um, things. So axion, of course, uh, as Andreas mentioned, and this is a pseudoscalar, and uh, axion. Um, solves this strong CP uh, problem through this Piché, Quinn, um, Weinberg, um, and Wilczek mechanism. Um, but you can uh, sort of generalize this uh, to axion-like particles. And uh, to me, this is uh, um, uh, sometimes people still call them axions, uh, but um, yeah, I think it's a good ter terminology to call Alps part, uh, you know, basically pseudoscalar particles that do not uh, solve strong CP. Then uh, there are scalar particles um, and um, uh, they are predicted actually uh, even in some string theories and uh, Andreas already mentioned them. Um, so there is a big difference uh, between pseudoscalar and scalar particles because uh, generically, uh, uh, if it's a pseudoscalar particle, it, it interacts with, uh, with spins. And so you can look for these particles, for instance, um, using uh, magnetometers or nuclear magnetic resonance as, we'll, as we will discuss. And, and these scalars, uh, uh, their uh, manifestation is different. They uh, effectively change the values of fundamental constants. For example, the fine structure constant alpha. And so this is how we look for them. Okay, then uh, going up, from zero to one in spin, you get vector particles. And there is again, a zoo of dark photons, hidden photons, whatnot. And then you can go uh, even to higher spins to tensor particles, which are actually rarely uh, discussed, but I think there is no profound reason for them not to be discussed, except that the theory gets more and more complex if I understand correctly, if you go to higher spins. By the way, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, uh, it would be really very helpful if you feel free to interrupt and ask questions uh, at any time. Uh, this I'd like it much better. We um, do not uh, owe anybody to, to go through all my slides and uh, just more important for us to, to make sure we are connected. Okay, so, but um, in this uh, overall list, the, the last thing is this uh, uh, axion quark nugget or anti quark nugget uh, framework of Zhidnitsky. Uh, and I think I find it very, very interesting. Um, uh, so I, maybe, maybe I'll tell you, and if not, there is also discussion. Um, okay. Uh, so here I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, now going to uh, uh, reproduce to you sort of the uh, uh, the, my learning path of, of a few years ago when I, uh, when I uh, started learning about this. Um, so um, I like to call it most uh, wanted file uh, about uh, dark matter, or what do we know? So we can start with some very basic facts. Um, so uh, if we want to explain uh, the rotation curve, for example, of our own galaxy or some other galaxy uh, with the existence of uh, dark matter, we, uh, we can do it. I prepared an exercise to do it um, uh, with you um, if we have time. Um, so, but uh, we can extract uh, actually the density is 0.4 uh, GeV per, uh, uh, per centimeter uh, cube, which corresponds, uh, if you remember, a, a proton mass is about one GV. So it's about one proton per three cubic centimeter. So it's a very, very low uh, density compared to the desk, for example, on which my computer is sitting, which has 10 to the 22 to the 23 
uh, proton equivalence per cubic centimeter, and this is uh, on the order of one. Um, nevertheless, it turns out that uh, because uh, uh, you know uh, it's not concentrated somehow, um, this is the dominant uh, mass uh, in, in the universe. Okay. Uh, the next uh, 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 simple observation that we make is that um, the, the, the dark matter sits in the galaxy, okay? And uh, uh, if it's gravitationally bound uh, to, to the galaxy, it, it means that it, it cannot be moving very fast because, uh, you know, there is escape velocity as we learned. Uh, some of us in sixth grade, in my case in sixth grade, but uh, some people in high school, some people learned about this in the first year of the uh, university, right? And for the escape velocity for the galaxy is about 10 to minus three um, of, the, of the speed of light. So um, if we say that there are these quasi free particles that are only bound by gravitation, mostly to, its, uh, to the other particles like this, in the galaxy, they better be non-relativistic um, uh, and um, cold dark matter is what it's called. Okay, so now comes, uh, 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 so these are completely trivial facts. Now, now comes the fact that just a little bit more advanced, it's maybe for first year of graduate school. And uh, this is the problem uh, actually surprisingly of uh, uh, electrons uh, in a metal. So basically Fermi gas. And um, so uh, the, the, the point is that, um, um, uh, so, so if, you, if you are trying to, to, uh, to put uh, some uh, electrons, for example, right, uh, or, or other fermions in, in a volume, uh, they are forbidden uh, by the Pauli principle to occupy the same uh, quantum state. And if you want to count the, Quantum states, if you recall, is D, D3P, D3V, right? So either, either they have to be spatially separated um, or um, uh, they have to be moving. So, so, so basically the separation with, uh, between them uh, has to be greater than the Broglie wavelengths. Otherwise uh, they start to occupy the same uh, quantum state. And this is a very a pretty simple calculation and, uh, and you can do it for the galaxy. Um, and uh, you can calculate, assuming, for example, zero uh, temperature, right? So you, you can uh, do this calculation and, and then you can calculate the, the, the Fermi uh, momentum and Fermi velocity uh, from this. But now you make an observation, you connect it to the previous line, that this Fermi velocity, please, cannot be uh, greater than this, the escape velocity. Otherwise, dark matter wouldn't be in the galaxy. It would fly away. And that uh, sets immediately the limit to, well, it depends on how you calculate 10, 20 electron volt. So if we assume that the particle um, uh, making like, okay, by the way, silently, we assume that there is just one particle uh, composing uh, dark matter, but it could be much more complicated, but we, we, I guess for simplicity, we don't talk about it. But so, so, so if you have one particle uh, and, 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 and you want it to be um, dark matter and it has to be lighter than 20 electron volts, then it, it better be a boson. Otherwise it, it will fly away because the Fermi velocity will be greater than the escape velocity of the galaxy. So this is how um, we know that ultralight dark matter is bosoning. Pretty, pretty amazing. So we've effectively determined the, 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 the spin of the particle. All right, so uh, let's assume, for example, uh, that this is a spin zero uh, a boson. Uh, then, um, 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 you know, we have relativistic uh, equation. Um, the, uh, we have the relativistic equations describing um, uh, the, um, the, the such such uh, uh, fields and, and this relativistic equation uh, uh, tell us uh, that uh, um, the, uh, the fields sh shouldn't be static; they should, in fact, uh, oscillate uh, in time uh, with the frequency 
um, that's e equal to um, to the energy. And in this case, it's a non-relativistic non particle. Most of the energy comes from the from the rest mass. So it's basically the Compton frequency of the particle. Okay, and um, uh, um, you know, as Andreas already showed by numerical uh, examples, we uh, we now have these fields composed uh, uh, the, uh, of a very very large number um, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of of these uh, of these particles. So. Uh, uh, just like um, in the case of uh, photons, it's often convenient to talk about the electromagnetic field uh, rather than individual uh, individual particles, and that's what we are going to talk about. So, so now we start to 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 get the contours of the model that we have. So, so our universe uh, contains in it some some kind of a of a field, classical field, like Andreas said, and uh, this field. Is oscillating, um, and the oscillation frequency uh, is uh, very close to the Compton frequency. Now, this is not the whole story because if we write the energy of the particles, it's uh, m c squared, the rest energy plus for non-relativistic particle m v squared over two. M v squared over two. So this V square, but we know that V uh, is 10 to minus three C. So we see that this kinetic energy term, if you like, because of this uh, number 10 to minus three is about 10 to minus six. So, so we now have an oscillator for which we also know sort of the spread of frequency in this simple model. So it's an oscillator with a pretty uh, high quality factor of about a million. So it, it means that if you, if you uh, measure an uh, uh, oscillation with one of our experiments, I'm going to describe uh, the, the, the phase will persist for about 1 million oscillations. Um, there is another interesting, uh, another interesting um, uh, constraint that we have, which again comes uh, from the fact uh, that uh, the dark matter is contained in the galaxy, and and uh, this is the lower limit uh, on the mass from this of, on the order of ten to minus twenty two electron volt, and that again comes from a very simple thing that we we want the dark matter to be associated with the galaxy and be on the order of the size of the galaxy, but uh, for such a light uh, bosonic particle, uh, by the way, this corresponds. If you, if you convert this electron volt to frequency unit, this corresponds to a period of oscillation of about a year, it's very slow oscillation. But the, the point is that the de Broglie wavelengths now of this uh, particle, uh, of this field that tells you what the extent, spatial extent is, is uh, on the order of the galactic size. So if we want the dark matter to be confined to, um, to, to the galaxy, it cannot be that light. Now, uh, uh, there is a lot of discussion uh, in the community about, uh, for instance, could it be uh, that this dark matter is a Bose-Einstein condensate? There are some people uh, like Pierre Sikivi uh, is a, lot, a big proponent of the idea that dark matter is actually a BEC. Uh, and, and this is still an open question. Uh, the, and again, uh, it depends on whom you talk to. Pierre will give you a lot of um, observational evidence that it is uh, a BEC, which, by the way, may mean longer uh, coherence times, long or higher Q factors than uh, are prescribed by just this uh, simple uh, picture. But this is again an open question, and we can discuss it further. All right. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so, so now this 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 general picture allows you to immediately do a lot of estimates. For instance. Uh, if I ask you what's the what's the number density uh, of particles, energy density, we already said one proton mass equivalent per three cubic centimeter. But what is the the number density? Well, if you say okay, if dark matter is um, uh, composed uh, of just one particle, I just divide the energy density by the mass uh, 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 density. And for instance, if we say that. Uh, it's an you know four nano EV for uh, just because it's a one megahertz frequency, 
then uh, it's 10 to the 17 such particles uh, per uh, cubic centimeter, just as a numerical example. And then uh, coherence time uh, is 10 to the six of uh, uh, basically Compton uh, frequencies. So for this numerical example of uh, four nano AV, um, uh, bosonic particle, it's about one second. And the coherence length, to find the coherence length, you need to multiply this by, by, the, by the speed. And the speed is, remember, 10 to minus three of the uh, um, uh, speed of light. So you put it, put it all in and you get uh, 300 kilometers. This is an example. Uh, um, right. Um, can, can I ask a question, Dima? Yes. yes. So, so uh, perhaps you can uh, uh, elucidate uh, all of us a little bit. I mean, there, there, there are two length scales. I mean, we have the De Broglie wave, uh, wavelength and we have the Compton wavelength. Yeah. So uh, can you give us a little bit of intuition what is relevant when? And I think that, that pretty much also uh, is, is, is the topic of coherence, right? Yeah, so, so these are non-relativistic uh, particles. Uh, uh, and I believe that uh, uh, what, is, uh, what is relevant uh, here is the Broglie wavelengths. Uh, so that, that, that tells you the spatial, uh, uh, the spatial scale because it's a, it's a bigger uh, scale and it, uh, it, uh, it determines the, the quantum degeneracy, uh, for example. And also uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the coherence links, so to say. But, but uh, yeah, so I'm asking because 314 doesn't have a velocity, so. That's coherence time, right? Oh, I see. That's coherence time. And to get coherence lengths, you do Yeah, you multiply. OK. okay. Thank you. And uh, but another important uh, thing is that, um, and, and, and there was, uh, uh, I guess, uh, quite a bit of discussion, because only now people are starting to appreciate this effect. And I will point out why this is important, is uh, that because this is like um, uh, a bit of a, a chaotic field, if you want, um, uh, this is not like a uniform um, uh, every, uh, thing everywhere. It, it sort of resembles uh, a speckle uh, in, a, in a you know laser um, uh, with uh, high coherence. If you uh, like uh, uh, shine the beam and it scatters in the room, you see, you see this this speckle basically like a random interference picture. And you have some places where uh, where you have a brighter region and a, a darker region, and and so. These estimates they tell you what is the spatial extent. This is coherence length, and and uh, and uh, the the time scale tells you that if you are uh, in a, in a dark place, how long this darkness will persist. And this is actually turns out uh, to be exper experimentally very important when you are talking about the 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 the, the very. Oh, I can tell you right now. Um, I was going to talk about this later, but tell you now. So uh, so ten, if you are uh, at the at the lower mass range uh, of the of the particles you are looking at uh, 10 to minus 10, 22 electron volt. Uh, it means that the, 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 the period is a year or so. And uh, the coherence time is a million periods, as we said. And so it's a million years. Now, uh, <laughs> one of these dark spots uh, persists for a million years. So now you, you, you mount an experiment and I'm telling you because we did that, right? Uh, you mount an experiment and you, you try very hard to find dark matter and you don't find dark matter uh, if you measure for a year, the typical like measurement time. So what can you say? So you can say, well, there is no dark matter, but, but then uh, you can say also, I was just very unlucky. Uh, I happened to, to do my experiment in, in the dark spot and now, I have to wait a million years uh, before it becomes bright, but there is really dark matter there. So you, so you have to. Um, um, th this presents actually uh, a, 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 an interesting statistics problem of, of how you infer some information about the existence of dark matter, and and uh, uh, we ourselves got it wrong at first, and uh, and then uh, and then we. Uh, uh, I think corrected it. It's not. It's not that bad. It, 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 at some point, it could feel hopeless than to do experiments uh, like like this. But in fact, uh, um, it turns out that there are factors that um, 
uh, uh, make it not so not so bad. Um, and all right. Is it demand, but does it not depend anyway on the mass that you're searching for? So you would always. Yeah, it does because, for instance, if you are searching uh, for you know much higher mass, then your coherence time could be you know a day or 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 or, or a second or whatever, and then then and then it's easy to do experiments over several coherence times and then forget about yeah. this issue uh, uh, completely, right? So yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's only relevant. If you go, if you're trying to explore this, and, you know, uh, super ultra light, yeah. But it's an interesting and, thing. And concerning the distinction between the De Broglie wavelength and the coherence length, so for the De Broglie wavelength, um, well, this would have to be uh, the, the cube of that would have to be bigger than the density that you have there to, to see the Bose-Einstein condensate, so to say. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, the the density, I think, uh, the density is uh, is sufficient. The question. About uh, the question is that if, if you if you want to form a BEC, um, you need uh, some some yeah. kind of interactions. Otherwise, it, uh, and uh, and that is a question uh, because the the uh, so may, Andreas would be much better person to discuss self interactions uh, of of dark matter. But uh, uh, but uh, 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 there is we know that nobody can escape gravity, so to say, right? So that so gravity already is a form. Uh, uh, and and uh, of self interaction and people are uh, doing a lot of theoretical sort of uh, estimates and my understanding is a bit of an open question uh, at the moment but it's a it's a very active area and, and you I could also say. thermalize dark matter via normal matter like you can make a photonic BEC uh, in a molecular gas like Martin Weitz is doing in Bonn uh, so hypothetically you could yeah. thermalize uh, dark matter uh, in, in normal matter so to say I think uh, yes. Uh, I, I think uh, there is a, a strong evidence um, uh, for um, uh, the strength of the interaction. That, that's a problem for us trying to detect that in dark matter. That there is evidence for very weak, feeble interaction of dark matter mm -hmm. with normal uh, matter uh, and with itself, by the way, as well, uh, apart from gravitation. So, so maybe, um, maybe, but it's. Um, Okay. Yeah, I don't think there is a uh, you know final mm -hmm. word on that. All right. Um, so now, uh, how do we search? And maybe uh, uh, this this slide is sort of uh, similar to a conclusion slide. I'll just show you uh, before we 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 uh, jump into discussing any of this in detail. I want to give you sort of in a broad stroke different things that we we do. So. Um, so uh, the, 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 there is a class of experiments that uh, is uh, uh, looking for dark matter in NMR um, experiments. But, but actually, I just, I just realized that maybe before I even start uh, on this, I should uh, maybe provide uh, a broad uh, classification uh, of the studies, of, of the searches for dark matter. So uh, one, uh, category is, uh, we say, okay, uh, if there is dark matter in the galaxy, uh, we should look for it. So it's, it's kind of astronomy, dark matter astronomy. And the, the, the devices that look for such uh, 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 galactic dark matter are, are called halo scopes because, uh, because of the notion that the dark matter forms sort of a halo of a, of a, of a uh, galaxy. So there's a halo scope. Um, then, as Andreas mentioned in his slide, there are uh, 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 hypotheses that our sun uh, can be producing um, axions, and this has to do with the fact that axions can uh, convert uh, uh, in, into photons by a couple of different um, mechanisms, and the photons uh, uh, can uh, convert into axions and typically what you have is a, like a strong magnetic field and a lot of photons and some of them convert, convert into uh, axions. Um, and um, and uh, <clears throat> you know, sun, the sun has a lot of photons uh, and a, lo a lot of magnetic fields. So, we, so hopefully it is producing uh, uh, axions. And, and then the, so the second class of experiments um, is um, yeah, is called helioscopes, 
from the word Helios, sun, right? So they look for axion from the sun. Uh, then there is another uh, class uh, of experiments and I, I, I don't know how to call them. Let's, uh, let's call them do-it-yourself uh, experiment. Uh, and uh, the light shining through, through walls experiments are, are, are of this type. So the idea is, okay, and Andreas and other theorists are t telling us that uh, axions can, can be converted, uh, uh, photons can be converted to axions. Very good. Let's do this. Let's take a laser, you know, have a lot of photons, send them through a strong magnet, make some axions. Now, how do we detect uh, axions? Or first, before, before that, uh, we make the axions and the axions uh, only weakly interact with matter. So if you put a wall in front, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, of this beam, you know, the light will, of course, not go through the wall, but the axions will shine nicely uh, through the wall. And then we have to detect them on the other side. Uh, and so once again, we pass them through a magnetic field, they make some photons, and then we detect photons. So these are, um, uh, it, it sounds pretty hopeless, right? Because in this case, the signal is proportional to the force power of the a small coupling constant, but 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 it's amazing the technology today is so advanced that these experiments, as Andreas pointed out, are actually competitive. Okay, so this is um, light shining through the wall. You can think, by the way, of the of the helioscope um, in uh, a bit also like light shining uh, through the wall, uh, where the part where you um, where you make axions, you just subcontract to the sun. You're saying, oh, this experiment is very complicated. So now I, I normally have to build two parts, axion production and axion detection. This is too expensive. I don't have the budget. I'm going to do only the second part. Uh, the first part will be done by the sun. OK. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is the principle of, uh, of the CAST uh, experiment, for example, and others. OK, so this is sort of the third uh, type. And now the fourth type of, uh, of um, uh, dark matter search experiments uh, is very interesting uh, because if you if you have some dark matter particles uh, uh, and these, these real particles presumably uh, make the dark matter uh, in the universe, they also should should exist in, in in vacuum, so to say, in their virtual form. For instance, axions, okay, or or dark photons or whatever. And so, if you um, then consider diagrams describing interactions between particles. Um, the, these virtual dark matter particles um, uh, should modify uh, these interactions. And so people do a lot of the kind of fifth force searches um, to indirectly look uh, for um, dark matter particles this way. I'll, if time permits, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about those. Uh, and of course, there is another type uh, which is um, uh, high energy experiments where you, uh, you know, collide particles and try to produce dark matter particles in, in collisions. All right, so uh, uh, now I'm, I'm uh, mostly, let's see what I have here. I'm, I, it's mostly, um, uh, but uh, not exclusively halescopes. Um, so, uh, the, so some of the experiments use nuclear magnetic resonance um, and uh, exploit uh, the interaction that Andreas mentioned of the sp spin interaction with um, spin interaction uh, with the dark matter field. One of the experiments uh, is Casper uh, Electric, shown here. I'll tell you more about it. Um, then uh, uh, you know you can um, also use advanced uh, atomic magnetometers. Um, to detect the quasi-magnetic fields uh, produced by dark matter. Uh, and uh, they are pretty advanced. Uh, and I'll tell you about these. Uh, uh, so I have this picture here because it's, it's basically done uh, by my colleagues um, at, um, um, at the um, uh, Institute um, at the University of Science and Technology in Hefei. Uh, in China, this is the same apparatus, but but a different experiment because here um, uh, there is actually a source of exotic interaction, and this is <clears throat> using the same kind of a magnetometer, but now trying to catch the, the uh, uh, unusual interaction produced by a heavy mass that rotates 
uh, uh, here in the vicinity of Prada. So all of these are tabletop um, experiments. Now, um, um, uh, so uh, uh, the theorists um, are extremely inventive uh, uh, people. Uh, and uh, uh, Andreas mentioned uh, the name uh, of Maxim Paspelov. Um, uh, and uh, he's a very uh, old friend of mine. And um, we, um, uh, going back some years, uh, we, we, we had an idea, uh, which um, <clears throat> at first was, was sort of very, uh, uh, I would say, uh, 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 well, uh, poetic, if you want. And the idea comes from the fact that if you are an experimentalist and you make some setup, and you like uh, watch on the oscilloscope um, what kind of signal uh, comes, then, uh, then there is often just noise. You see basically noise. Um, and uh, uh, your uh, human head is, uh, uh, is interesting because if you stare at the noise, uh, that's dynamic, you know, like the noise for a long time, you, st you start seeing things, you, ca you can't help it, but uh, uh, it's called, Psychologists call it constructive boredom. You start seeing, you know, that there's something in your signal. And so the idea we had is, was this, that's uh, uh, with, with my former student who is a professor in Krakow, uh, we were discussing this. We, we, uh, we, we said, look, uh, one guy sits um, uh, uh, in Berkeley uh, and one guy sits at Krakow and they both are, are staring at the noise and start imagining, oh, I saw something, I saw something. What if they uh, uh, provide um, uh, sort of make a catalog of these uh, uh, suspected signals, okay? Uh, and, uh, and the GPS time them, for example, and then compare nodes. If it turns out that uh, the, the, uh, these two guys or more more, as you can see in this picture, start seeing things uh, in a correlated fashion, this will be a very, very good um, uh, indication that there is something is going on. And at first we had a very vague idea of, of what that might be. And so we started calling all our theory friends to see, um, is there something uh, in, in the dark matter that, that caused these correlated signals in the network uh, of sensors? And, and so uh, uh, everybody immediately said, oh, this is such a great idea. We'll think about it, but only Maxim Paspelov came up actually with some, <laughs> with a real model. And the model is that um, these dark matter fields in the simplest model, they are just uh, basically chaotic and feel uh, everything, but, but they can also uh, form what's called topological structures. And they, these structures could be um, uh, of all dimensions. They could be sort of zero um, dimension and that's called boson stars. I, I think it's a very bad name because there's probably not a star, but some, some kind of a clump, okay? Um, uh, and such models have been built. There is one dimensional, this is uh, dark matter strings, okay? Some kind of, uh, then there are two dimensional things, the main walls they are called um, and so on. And so there, uh, so there are now uh, it's becoming more and more popular uh, searches where um, people look for topological dark matter by having a network of sensors, in our case, of the GNOME uh, experiment. Uh, uh, so, so these are actually uh, precision magnetometers that are enclosed in, ma uh, in magnetic uh, uh, shields. Um, and um, uh, so that dark matter ignores the magnetic shielding and goes through and, and hopefully causes correlated signals in, 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 in different uh, sensors here. Um, there are also now sensors uh, of clocks, including the GPS uh, system. And it turns out that actually this, once you get your mind uh, in this strange kind of uh, thinking, you, you, you discover very, very interesting things. For instance, it turns out that uh, the entire planet Earth um, has a whole uh, network of amazing instruments that are called superconducting gravimeters. And these devices uh, can measure the small g, the acceleration of gravity down to 10 to minus 12 uh, per root hertz. So every second, 10 to minus 12. These are really amazing instruments. And there is a whole network of several uh, uh, dozen uh, of them. 
and they have been in operation for the last 40 years. And the data are free for you to download and there are uh, friendly geophysicists who even want to talk to you about it. And so we, we had uh, uh, this, um, actually, I should say Professor Alan Mills um, uh, had this uh, idea and uh, he talked to us and we picked it up and eventually did this search for, um, you see, if, if you start talking about some, some stuff that very weakly interact with matter, except for gravitation, in principle, it could be trapped um, in the earth and undergo oscillations within the earth. And then these oscillations can then be picked up by this network uh, of gravimeters. And, and so you can see here a suggestive cartoons. You see uh, this object here, does it remind you of uh, something? Yeah, yeah, so that's... Uh... <laughs> All right. Um, uh, uh, then um, uh, there's a whole other story, uh, and this has to do with the searches for scalar, uh, uh, scalar dark matter, dilatons, specifically. Um, and uh, the, the story goes back to some years when uh, Asimina Arvanitaki um, from uh, the Perimeter Institute uh, uh, suggested that um, uh, the experiments looking for uh, for variation of fundamental constants could be looking for dilatons. And uh, so we first founded an experiment with this prosium and, and then later on everybody who has a clock is doing this and this is one developing in a wonderful uh, direction. But more recently, uh, people realized that these variations of fundamental constants don't have to be uh, sort of slow. They, if, the, if the field oscillates, um, then this variation could be actually uh, fast. And uh, so again, uh, we propose some, some kind of a, um, a technique based on atomic spectroscopy, on Doppler free spectroscopy. And now a lot of people are doing this as well. It's very exciting. I'll, I, I will tell you more if we have time. Um, then, five minutes. Perfect. Fantastic. Uh, then, uh, then um, uh, there's something I, I must tell you, I'm uh, also uh, exceptionally excited about. Uh, so a few years uh, ago already, I guess three now, um, antimatter uh, in the form of trapped antiprotons at the, uh, with the base experiment at CERN was used as a probe for dark matter. Now, now there's only one or two antiprotons uh, used for this. So if you, if you assume that dark matter has exactly the same interactions with matter and antimatter, uh, this is not a very impressive experiment. But there are scenarios, and they are not so crazy, where uh, dark matter could be interacting with antimatter uh, much stronger than it interacts with, and, um, uh, with normal matter. And uh, I have a specific example uh, of this, actually. Uh, and then this would be opening sort of a portal to, to uh, some ve very interesting and, and very different kind of uh, dark matter physics. And uh, there are always uh, crazy ideas uh, and proposals, and uh, uh, I will be glad to uh, discuss them with you in the second hour. And uh, so I think maybe uh, this is, uh, kind of good uh, place to to stop and maybe have a little discussion if you like. Um, thank, thank you very much, Sima. Uh, good timing and um, super interesting talk. Um, I I don't see any hand up right now, and the chat is still waiting to be filled. But uh, maybe you can tell me already or us. Um, so why why should antimatter couple so differently to dark matter? Shouldn't, uh, but I think uh, if it does, it wouldn't be too too crazy. And uh, if we get to the discussion, so what, there's I know one specific uh, uh, um, um, uh, situation. So so okay. So uh, maybe maybe one general remarks. So we have a standard model uh, of everything, right? The standard picture. And uh, we all understand that we need to look for physics beyond the standard model. But uh, it would be a bit paradoxical, but I believe that most of the beyond the standard model physics 
is actually extremely conventional. So what happens? You have your Lagrangian uh, standard model, and then you say, well, why don't I write another term that perhaps, you know, CP violating or something like this, you know, but, but it, 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 it's basically the same, the same paradigm. And then, and then I look for consequences of that term. I look for some asymmetries in beta decay, some, some, something. But a, this is a, a, a conventional physics. But, but then um, there are uh, certain things that clearly would require um, going beyond, uh, in some way, going beyond. So I, I, I called it um, not BBSM, beyond, beyond standard model. <laughs> BBSM. Um, and uh, these are things that uh, have to do with violation of CPT symmetry, uh, for example, um, and spin statistics, uh, mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, because the, these things are theorems within uh, the conventional field theory, so so you need to uh, to go mm -hmm. beyond, and sometimes it's not done. So so um, this presents, by the way, great difficulty to experimentalists who are trying to uh, explore violations of these. Um, uh, so so parity violation is a beautiful theory, yeah, no problem, uh, and even CP violation, but CPT no. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and spin statistics, uh, uh, there are experiments trying to look, for example, for the possibility of uh, of photons being in a sort of non-symmetric uh, mm -hmm. uh, states. And, but but uh, but there is no electrodynamics that has been built uh, for such such a photons. So um, okay. then then you, you, what we know doesn't apply, and, and so in principle it could be a lot. But mm -hmm. uh, another example within conventional, uh, more or less conventional physics is this axion quark uh, nuggets. And uh, Zhitnitsky thinks that um, these objects, um, uh, they, they uh, have uh, more antimatter in them because of the initial conditions in the early universe. So that's where the antimatter is, it's within these nuggets. Oh, um, yeah. And then these nuggets then have 100% asymmetry uh, in mm -hmm. their interaction between matter and antimatter, okay, and and they are not uh, uh, they are not uh, it's not a crazy thing. Okay, mm. interesting. So the two more questions. Uh, one hand is up, Thomas. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thanks, Dima, for your uh, amazing talk. I have a question uh, regarding the square meters. So you you told us that there are um, very nice geophysicists. Who have these gravimeters looking for or open, um, uh, opening up the data for this? I've uh, heard recently that um, those geophysicists actually also look into using very precise atomic clocks, um, which are now able to uh, really measure time in a so precise manner that you can um, measure also gravity with them. I want to use them. Uh, together with this uh, gravity meters. Um, is this also planned in the dark matter sector to use these very precise uh, clocks? Yeah, so generally what happens, first of all, uh, this is a question uh, by Thomas uh, Kreishmer, who um, as an undergraduate student uh, worked uh, a bit on one of the magnetometers uh, um, uh, uh, in, uh, currently operating uh, at Berkeley in this stations of height. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yes, so uh, I, 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 so what, what's, what's happening that once, once people sort of uh, bring this idea to, to, to public about, you know, that um, if you have an atomic clock, you, you, you can search for dark matter or if you have a magnetometer and so on, then, then uh, people really try to, 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 uh, to do this as much as possible, which is, which is great, right? Because if when you, when you when you are a clock person, you uh, spend most of your time trying to like improve the performance uh, of your clock and, and and verify that the performance is good. And if if uh, while you are doing this uh, kind of work, you can also uh, search uh, simultaneously for uh, some interesting manifestations of um, uh, dark matter. This is this is uh, very welcome. And so now there are uh, international networks of clocks, as I mentioned. Uh, looking for 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 this uh, kind of stuff, topological dark matter. Absolutely. Okay. So effectively, cool. Thanks. Uh, dark matter would change kind of the uh, fine structure constant and the binding of the. For example, or 
mass uh, or uh, or the ratio of the mass of the electron to to the proton. Um, there are two more questions in the chat. Well, you can read them yourself as you wish. So, Peter Matak. Um, yeah. Oops. You mean the the people who ask Sorry. questions? Yeah, they, they should. Yeah. So, <laughs> Peter, do you want to to say what you want to ask? But the mass limit was set to 20 e volts. So what people usually do with the constraints from nucleus synthesis, uh, num limiting the number of degrees of freedom. Um, uh, da -da -dum. So the, the, the first part I understand, the second part, may, maybe Dima knows immediately what, what you mean. I can, I, can, I can comment on that. I think, yeah. uh, I think uh, Peter's question is related to um, in the early universe, um, that there's a limit coming from extra radiation degrees of freedom. And he's probably having in mind that whenever you have new particles that are lighter than uh, MeV, so big M, mega electron volts, then, and if they become thermally excited, they contribute to the energy budget and they, so, and they change the, you know, the way how the universe expands because uh, it's, I mean, the Hubble rate measures everything that's in it basically. Uh, but here, if you remember Maxime's lectures, all these kind of uh, ultralight bosonic um, fields, they, they, they are in the category of uh, ultra cold dark matter. So they, the, the way how they are produced are often through like this misalignment mechanism and so on. So, so they, they come, they start with zero momentum basically. And so they are completely neg negligible compared to radiation. And um, so, so it basically the, the N effective contribution that's often, I mean, it's often measured in this N effective parameters is completely negligible. And in fact, we, we, we need their energy density later on to, to create galaxies and so on. Mm -hmm. And then there's Yifan Chen, and maybe you want to read it out, Yifan? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, lecture. So I have a question is uh, in opto mechanical system like LIGO uh, or like some cavity search for action like uh, Haystack, there are many quantum technology used uh, like squeezing. So I wonder if there are such similar things uh, uh, as well in the NMR or spin-based uh, sensor systems or like automatic clock. So uh, there's a, <laughs> um, uh, there's a, um, uh, the, the debate about how to define uh, quantum sensing. Uh, and it's, it's, it's actually uh, funny because uh, there is a, a journal called uh, Quantum Science and Technology, and my colleague Mariana Safronova and I are currently uh, uh, guest editing an issue uh, that is called like quantum technologies, um, uh, quantum uh, technologies for fundamental physics discovery or something along those lines. You can check it out. Maybe I'll have a reference on uh, on uh, on future slides. And um, so we uh, wrote um, uh, an editorial uh, article uh, for this collection of, of maybe 20 or so uh, papers. And the title of the paper is called Quantum Technology and the Elephants. Um, by the way, the archive rejected this paper. Uh, 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 it was the first time uh, uh, I had a paper rejected by the archive. Because I guess they didn't like the title, but the, the, uh, it, is a, it appears uh, with that title in the Quantum uh, Science and Technology Journal. But in this article, we, we say that you can, um, so, so people try to define quantum uh, technologies as those that um, uh, specifically use um, a squeezing, um, spin squeezing, for example, uh, or multi-particle entanglement uh, to enhance quantum measurements. And what Mariana and I argue is that essentially for any measurement, you can introduce these elements. Um, and it's very interesting to explore, but uh, it, uh, it's not always that uh, these specific things, uh, uh, squeezing and entanglement, uh, use uh, lead to necessarily improving the sensors. And so we, we provide a definition of a quantum sensor that, that basically is broader. That's a, uh, a, that a quantum sensor is anything that's using a quantum system for um, uh, you know, measurement and readout of the of the e effect. And sometimes 
um, I think it's, it's better to, 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 to stay broad. And, and that, in that respect, all of these technologies you see uh, here are very much uh, quantum. If you, uh, if you consider this narrow definition, I'm, I'm afraid that none of them uh, currently uh, is, uh, uh, is, is quantum, even though uh, people are starting to use, for instance, um, entanglement in uh, superconducting qubits for single microwave photon detection, um, et cetera. But this uh, uh, last thing here is, uh, uh, is, a, is, a, is a proposal to use uh, uh, basically uh, a, a, me a mechanical system. And we, we uh, found that um, the such levitated magnets, for example, they beat uh, all kinds of uh, quantum limits. Um, and we were very puzzled by this. Uh, and I think it's very interesting and it does, it's kind of similar to, uh, it has collective effects in it and kind of similar to entanglement, but, but doesn't really have entanglement um, or mm -hmm. squeezing uh, in it. So I, uh, I don't know if I answered the question. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Mm.